some orange and some tents. I'm a direct, the director of the public law program, and I'm going to take just a second to do what everyone else has so far, which because, just simply because it's so richly deserved, and that's to thank Tyler Friedman for being the, the spark, the instigator, the laboring oar, the moving force uh, in, in this event. It was a, a gleam in his eye, and uh, not only that, he uh, really put it together uh, from beginning to end. And as somebody who does conferences regularly, I can tell you these events have lots of moving parts, and Tyler has mastered them all. So if he doesn't want to go into law enforcement, there's a, a, a conference planning uh, career uh, waiting for him. We're going to follow uh, roughly the pattern that we uh, used in the first panel this morning of some opening remarks of five to ten minutes from each of our four panelists and then open it up for questions and answers. Yes, there are four panelists. Uh, Judge Rosen from the Eastern District of Michigan has been trying to get here all day, and I'm told that he's in a car coming from the airport to here and should be here momentarily. So we will add him to the, the panel. I'll make just one format change just to mix things up slightly and do the introductions of all the panelists at the beginning and then just hand off the microphones to each of them in order. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, William Hochul. Bill is uh, chief of the anti-terrorism unit in the Western District of New York. He's been in the Justice Department uh, in various capacities since 1987. He's also worked in the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. He's prosecuted international crime, financial crimes, other white-collar crime, uh, and he's uh, probably most uh, known in the media as the lead prosecutor of the Lackawanna 6 uh, trial. Um, to his immediate left is Andrew Ruska. Uh, Drew is chief assistant in the Eastern District of New York. We're not keeping with the Southern District of New York thread, but we're still keeping with a New York thread here this afternoon, which uh, he's... he's uh, a position he's occupied since June of 2003. Immediately before that, he was uh, senior counsel to the DAG, the Deputy Attorney General in the Department of Justice, Larry Thompson. And he's had uh, experience as well in the uh, New York City District Attorney's Office, securities fraud, financial crimes. Uh, and he came to uh, public service from a stint a while back in the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. So I guess if uh, John has sold his soul by moving from the prosecutor's office to a private practice, Drew had redeemed his by <laughs> moving in the other direction. And to his left is Jeffrey Mearns. Uh, Jeff is uh, also in private practice currently, served for nine years as a fe federal prosecutor in various other positions in the Justice Department. And in 1997 and 98, uh, he assisted in the prosecution of uh, Terry Nichols. And uh, uh, for that and other service to the department was awarded the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award, which is one of the highest awards uh, the Attorney General can give. As I say, he then left private, uh, to go into private practice at Baker and Hostetler, but he is in July becoming Dean of the Cleveland Marshall School of Law uh, at Cleveland State. And um, his soul is now for sale <laughs> for, for a large contribution to the school. Uh, I'll save my introduction of Judge Rosen uh, until uh, he arrives. And we'll simply turn it over to uh, my three expert prosecutors. We're going to try to get a little bit down into the nuts and bolts, hopefully not too far down into the nuts and bolts of, of uh, of putting cases together and the, the particular problems and instruments that uh, prosecutors and investigators are using to construct uh, responses to uh, the, counter, the, the threat of terrorism. So we'll lead off with Bill. Thank you, Professor, and thank you all for coming to this panel discussion. Thank you especially to Dean Bartlett for hosting this event. All of the students of Duke Law School, you've made me and my son feel very welcome. 
Um, as to Tyler Friedman, I also uh, join in giving him much deserved applause. Frankly, when uh, Tyler called our office and spoke to my boss, United States Attorney Mike Battle, <clears throat> it was our opinion that uh, Tyler Friedman must have been Professor Friedman, perhaps somebody of the stature <laughs> of Professor Schroeder, because of the ambitious nature of this seminar that um, he expressed to us he was putting together. And we also were mindful that it would cost a substantial amount of resources to host an event like this. But I was as shocked as anybody to learn for the first time yesterday evening upon meeting Tyler that he's only a law student. And I suppose that's also a tribute to the law school, that it gives students such as yourselves the opportunity to explore and really develop programs that you feel are important to your own development and also to that of the country. Hello, Your Honor. Don't let me interrupt. All right. No, it's okay. <laughs> this was literally a fly-in. <laughs> I was going to uh, point out to Jonathan after his introduction of the morning's panel that not everybody at the panel has connections to New York City or Cleveland since I'm from Buffalo. But Professor Schrader took my thunder away and drew a linkage. In fact, I'm in the same state as my colleagues from New York City, albeit probably eight hours, 400 miles away. And that's about halfway again to Cleveland where the rest of the panelists are from. We are a city of, and a region of some renown. Certainly, we have 200 miles of water border. We have over 2 million people in our federal district. Our federal district is 17 counties, a number of major cities. We have major power industries. We have some chemical industries. We're also the closest port of entry to Canada. And as Mr. Garcia pointed out, there are problems on the northern border when it comes to perhaps monitoring and being aware of everybody that's entering our shores or our territorial United States. So if you think for a moment of some of the problems that we may have as a country in, ins in ensuring who it is that's residing and living and visiting us, you can compound them somewhat when you think that if the northern border isn't as closely monitored as perhaps it should be, we are now dependent on Canadian authorities to make sure that they're doing all their checks and uh, ascertaining the desirability, perhaps, of some people to visit their shores and then coming into our country through either Buffalo or Niagara Falls. But as Professor Schroeder pointed out, I don't want to give you a geography lesson. I really instead would rather give you a little bit more of a bird's eye view as one who's now been in the industry, the criminal justice industry for 18 years, as to how it is we prosecute terrorist cases. Now we're not New York City, and for that reason we didn't have this concept called a Joint Terrorism Task Force before 9-11. What we did have was an Office of Federal Prosecutors, and we actually are based in two different cities, and we provided support for a great network of state and local prosecutors. As many of you know, the vast majority of criminal cases in this country are brought at the state or local level. The federal government generally doesn't have expansive jurisdiction. We have limited jurisdiction when it comes to criminal offenses. And when it came to terrorism offenses, we didn't have any terrorism cases in our district, as large as it is, until the Lackawanna 6 case. Now, in terms of strict accuracy, I should point out, it's really the Lackawanna 7 case. There's one man who never came home, and he's the subject of a $5 million reward out for him. So I'll give you some descriptive uh, identifiers when we leave here today. I don't know exactly what the law school tuition rate is these days, but if you have some information, perhaps you can help me and the people in uh, northern and western New York get back Mr. Lackawanna 7. But post 9-11, we did create the FBI, along with many other authorities, this concept called the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Now, what is that? The Joint Terrorism Task Force is unlike any other animal that I've ever been uh, associated with. It is a working group of state, local, and federal officials, and in some areas, intelligence officials. All of these folks that serve on this Joint Terrorism Task Force are co-located. 
They get together 24-7 in dedicated office space. They also have a very high level of security clearance because some of the information which is being reviewed and which is being produced throughout the world, which theoretically the Joint Terrorism Task Forces have access to, carry their own high level of security classification. And that kind of information can only be used under very serious and strict conditions. And it's up to the Joint Terrorism Task Forces to maintain the integrity of information just in case a prosecution never arises. But in any case, this Joint Terrorism Task Force, state, local, federal, and intelligence partners works together. They bounce off ideas. They try to get leads and obtain information from ways that normal police agencies receive information. The police officer on the street may be making a uh, traffic stop and observe something of suspicion. He would route it through channels where it would ultimately come to rest in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Perhaps citizens would observe something special. And of course, in our country, we really don't have a great number of law enforcement officials on the street. We're not like some countries where there's men toting guns on every other corner. We generally have relied on voluntary compliance with our criminal laws as far as maintaining the health and the welfare of our, uh, of our country is concerned. But if citizens receive complaints who are out there, they might forward those to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. There might be leads from other divisions because now post 9-11, every division of the FBI in the country has one of these Joint Terrorism Task Forces. And if they develop information from perhaps the Clevelands of the New York Cities that impacts on Buffalo, that gets routed to the same office. There's some value added done. An agent may look at a particular lead and sitting next to him may be somebody who's in a police agency that has responsibility for that street corner where the lead discusses. So they'll discuss the importance of that lead. Maybe, like I said, add some significant details that weren't known and perhaps a case will begin. Now whether a case is opened or not by the Joint Terrorism Task Force depends on some guidelines. We don't need to get into those. The Attorney General promulgates these guidelines. Certainly there's a resource question with all investigations. Although really, when it comes to terrorism investigations, resources, if there's a list of 10 things that uh, should concern those of us in government, resources is down below 10, but it's out there. Nevertheless, resources would be dedicated. Once we determine whether or not a case should be instituted, whether or not it's perhaps a viable threat, you heard some of the earlier panelists discuss that sometimes the information is categorized. Is this information that relates to a actual criminal event that already took place? If that happens, you heard Mr. Garcia describe what happened during the investigative stages of World Trade Center One. The Joint Terrorism Task Force, working with all of their partners, puts together what we call in the industry a reactive case. We try to figure out who done it. And what that involves is all kinds of forensic specialists, computer specialists, people who have street smarts going to the scene of the crime, picking up little fibers, tool marks, perhaps uh, the piece of trunk or car that had the serial number. And that's analyzed and we try to figure out who committed what. Most likely in the terrorism event, certainly uh, post 9-11, since our mission really is prevention first, our case, our investigation, our lead will not involve a historical reactive case. It's going to involve allegations of ongoing criminality. Perhaps uh, one of the panelists mentioned allegations of ongoing material support. There's various laws that we use to investigate and prosecute those offenses. But depending on what the allegation is, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, working with me, a prosecutor, or somebody in my anti-terrorism unit, we discuss what particular techniques may be brought to bear on that particular investigative subject. Now, there's a great range of techniques that can be used in an anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism case. You heard some of them mentioned today. 
Many of the techniques are traditional law enforcement techniques, and typically those are divided into two different categories, overt techniques and covert techniques. Covert techniques are generally preferable, particularly if you don't want to uh, apprise the subject that uh, you suspect them of some perhaps ongoing material support of a terrorist organization. What would those be? Well, there might be confidential sources of information. That's a category of witness, if you will, uh, with whom the government has said, your information will not be made public, your identity will not be made public. We'll do everything we can to keep that confidential. They're called confidential sources of information. As far as a prosecutor like me may be concerned, um, that's not information that I ordinarily get excited about. Myself and others who are uh, on the prosecutive side of things, we're looking for courtroom quality evidence. Somebody who's prepared to stand up in court and said, this is what I know and that's uh, who I know it from. But apart from confidential sources still in this covert technique, there may be undercover operations. These are operations that have been done since time immemorial in which law enforcement officers pretend to be somebody else. Those are always good techniques because generally the credibility of undercover operatives is high. They're police officers, they've been trained, they know techniques. On occasion they can elicit information that's helpful because they know the elements of offenses. Can you think of an obvious problem with using the undercover technique when it comes to infiltrating terrorist cells? One is that the undercover operative probably isn't known by the terrorist operative, and so he won't be trusted, and there won't be a great amount of information that'll flow. So if we can't use a live person, in the case of an undercover operative, in the case of a confidential source, then we may use another covert technique, such as wiretapping. And typically in federal court, the kind of wiretaps we use are all set forth in statute. They're called Title III wiretaps. And what you have to do to get one of these, first of all, you have to go to a federal judge. Judge Rosen, at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the panel here, would be a judge with the authority to authorize this kind of intrusive technique. And what we have to prove to Judge Rosen, and certainly he's from an entirely di different branch of government, Article 3 than we are in Article 1 is that there's probable cause that uh, a crime was committed, that there's probable cause that the person that we want to monitor committed that crime, and probable cause that the facility that we want to bug or wiretap will be used in furtherance of the criminal event. That's a high standard. And not only that, we've got to prove to Judge Rosen that that is the least intrusive means available to us given the limitations of our particular investigation. If we can get information that way, great. Um, the target certainly don't know about it and we can then develop and figure out a game plan as to who it is that's doing what. In the event that technique works or even if it doesn't work, in order to bring a criminal case, as you know, in the United States, you have to use a grand jury and you have to get an indictment. But just before I leave the covert techniques, let me mention that in law, there's one other particular form of surveillance that's authorized under federal law that the intelligence committee uses, or community uses, that's called the FISA techniques. Generally, that information is classified at a very high level and uh, that information, uh, perhaps one of the other experts here will speak about the use of that kind of information. But once we impanel a grand jury, then at that point it is the prosecutor's show. We present witnesses, we can compel witnesses through subpoena power, we can uh, try to uh, subpoena records, documents, at an appropriate point, working with the counterterrorism section in the District of Columbia, a decision is made that an indictment should perhaps be requested. If that's the case, then the grand jury votes on the indictment. If an indictment's handed up, the process begins that the public is familiar with, and then you get defense counsel, and you get the full panoply of due process rights, of discovery, 
Brady disclosures and a great deal of other process before you even get to the trial process. So that's a little bit of how I do my job. Like I said, I'm at the JTTF on just about a daily basis. At any given time, we have a number of files opened and being worked. And it's a, a very a busy process. And all of us are very sensitive to the idea, though, that it's not just enough anymore to prove that a crime has been committed, which was always my mentality pre-9-11. I was in an organized crime unit before we even thought of having this terrorism uh, unit. But now it's prevent terrorist offenses. Because if you listen to what bin Laden says, and if you take him at his word when he says he's coming and he wants to attack us, then truly what's contemplated are catastrophes of biblical proportion. And that just cannot be allowed to happen. And the men and women in law enforcement, I can assure you, have dedicated their lives to trying to prevent future terrorist attacks as much as prosecute those that have been committed. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Drew. Oh, okay. Um, you've heard, I gather, from a number of Southern District uh, prosecutors. So let me, before I get into the, into the thick of things, tell you a little bit about the Eastern District of New York, which is a particularly interesting place to practice law and be a prosecutor, and uh, especially from the standpoint of counterterrorism. It comprises actually most of New York City, both in population and area. It's Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the uh, counties of Nassau and Suffolk and Long Island. We have over 8 million people. And uh, unfortunately, we, ha we are one of the epicenters of uh, terrorism, terrorist activity in the United States. Uh, our office, as are all the other parts of the Justice Department, but our office is focused intently on challenging terrorists on doing counterterrorism investigations and uh, disrupting and preventing terrorism in any way we can. In a way, that, uh, that forces us to think a little bit more outside the box than you would if you were just a organized crime prosecutor or a financial crimes prosecutor. We have to understand a couple of things about our place in the world and our place in the nation's efforts to combat terrorism. Unlike uh, if you're prosecuting a securities fraud, if you're pro prosecuting a mafia, Don, you're not the only show in town. There are other players involved. There are other equities. Um, we have to deal with the intelligence agencies. Obviously, the military plays a large role in our counterterrorism efforts as a whole. And we have to understand that at the end of the day, we may not wind up in a court of law with whatever we've got. We may just be part of, an, part of a, an, another larger process, which has, which is, is, is a difficult way for prosecutors to reorient themselves and think, but I think we've, we've successfully done that. At least I know we've done in the Eastern District. Um, there are, broadly speaking, two types of counterterrorism investigations. And I, I'm the chief assistant in the district, so perhaps I have a, a slightly more um, policy-oriented focus than, than Bill Hochul does, and I, I play a slightly different role. I'm not the line-level supervisor. I'm the point of contact between department leadership and, and our line-level people. I help oversee our counterterrorism program. It's, uh, it's obviously an intent focus of our office, so I spend a lot of time on that. And the way I, the way I see the world, uh, even before you get to the specific statutes, the types of investigations we, we do are, on the one hand, pure terrorism investigations, and we, and we do have some of those. Um, investigations involving people or organizations who want to come to the United States and kill people and destroy property. Uh, sometimes they're already here, sometimes they're planning to come here, and obviously that has to be job one. That is the immediate threat. I mean, that, that's September 11th and uh, the, World Trade, the earlier World Trade Center bombing case and all of the threats and conspiracies that were discovered in, in the interim. Uh, and continue to be discovered. I mean, we have the El, El Shafé case right now where um, some uh, people from Staten Island were planning to blow up the subway station at Herald Square that were prosecuting my office. But an, another emerging uh, trend is the focus on terrorist financing investigations. And I think that's a good thing, that we're starting to spend more and more time on that, because the more we're spending time on uh, 
preventing, disrupting, and prosecuting terrorist financing cases. That means we're getting at the lifeblood of terrorism before they can get a chance to take those dollars and those resources and put them to uh, bad work uh, killing us and, and, and uh, uh, harming our interests. Terrorism financing investigations it owe a lot in their development to more routine criminal investigations in which prosecutors and agents have become expert over the years. They look and feel something like a mixture of a uh, financial crimes, regular financial crimes investigation or an organized crime investigation. There's a particular statute that most of, most of the work is done under, which is 18 U.S.C. 2339B, which prohibits, criminalizes material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. Um, it is an interesting sort of a statute. It, the, the term material support is quite broad under the statute. The term foreign terrorist organization is also defined. There's a whole procedure, and you may have gotten into this in the earlier panel, but um, there's a procedure for the Attorney General and the Treasury Secretary and the Secretary of State to confer and for the State Department to designate certain organizations and list them out, say these are foreign terrorist organizations. And if you have, uh, if you're rendering material support, if you're giving them money, resources, uh, tangible assistance of almost any sort, that is, a, that is a crime. That's a very serious federal crime, and, and we're going to prosecute it. That list is published in the Federal Re Register. It changes. A designation is generally for two years, but is renewable as long as the organization is still a foreign terrorist organization. It has many of the uh, well-known terrorist organizations. Al-Qaeda is on the list, obviously. Hamas, uh, various Palestinian terrorist organizations. But there are many other organizations that are not quite as well known and yet have been designated to pose a threat to American national security, such as the, uh, the Tamil Tigers from Sri Lanka or the, the Kakh movement in, in Israel. There, there's, it's a long list. Um, it uh, poses certain challenges, special challenges for prosecutors, and that we have to prove the intent to violate this statute. It's, it's a bit, it's, it's somewhat esoteric. We have to show that the person knew they were providing support. They don't have to understand the definition of material support, but we have to show that the defendant knew that he was in providing support to an organization which was, is intentionally violent, is an is a organization that backs uh, terrorism, that is trying to go out and kill people and harm American interests. Uh, it's the, I can't say very much about it because it's a case that's being tried right now, but perhaps the most important um, material support case in the country right now is uh, the Amoyad case, which is being tried in, in our court right now by our prosecutors, and we're in the middle. We're in the middle of the trial. It involves material support to uh, uh, Al Qaeda and, and Hamas. Um, in addition to the material support statute itself, however, we do everything in our power. You know, we really try to think outside of the box in order to get at the terrorism problem. We will prosecute currency money remitting cases. Uh, there are license, there are uh, statutes which require licensing in order to be a money remitter, and there are forms you have to fill out and procedures you have to file. And people don't do that. It doesn't immediately sound like a, a heinous crime, and yet we found that that is a good way of getting at sources of terrorism, terrorist finance, when it is difficult to put the money in the hands of that foreign terrorism organization in, in an evidentiary sense. We'll prosecute money remitters. We'll prosecute outbound currency cases. One of the interesting things about the Eastern District of New York is uh, we have one of the largest ports of entry and exit in the country, JFK Airport. And uh, Mike Garcia's people and, and his colleagues from uh, Customs and Border Protection are always on the watch for, for people coming in and out with currency. And there's no law against bringing currency in and out of the country. It's just you have to declare it when you're doing it. Uh, if, as in a recent case, you uh, uh, have tens of thousands of dollars and you don't declare it, uh, then you've lied on the form that you're supposed to fill out, and that can be prosecuted independently. Uh, we'll also prosecute other kinds of types of crime and fraud that seem more garden variety, but actually are part of our counterterrorism efforts. They won't always be labeled as such, even in court or in the press. Uh, sometimes it's asylum fraud or document fraud. 
cases which might seem minor at first blush and yet are, are one link in that chain of disrupting and preventing terrorism, which is, which is the end goal. Um, sometimes even more standard uh, crimes like uh, financial crimes or drug crimes can be used not because they're terrorism crimes themselves, but they can be used to compromise defendants and encourage them to cooperate in an investigation. I mean, one of the problems that Bill Hochul pointed out is, well, how do you, in, how do you insinuate a law enforcement agent into the middle of a terrorist consp conspiracy? Obviously, that would be the best way to find out what's going on. The next best thing is to find somebody who is in league with the terrorists or who knows them well enough to give you information and convince him through the means that we do have at our, uh, at our disposal to become an agent for the government or to cooperate with the government at least and help us get information or become a source upon which we can base something like an application for a wiretap or an application for a FISA warrant. F FISA actually is, is very important uh, and Bill alluded to it, but I want to say just a little bit more about it. it. It's somewhat complex how the statute works, but it gives us the opportunity to get information even if we can't articulate probable cause of a crime. That's very important in the terrorism area because we often have suspicions, we often have information collected from diverse sources of uneven reliability, we have information that comes from overseas, and we don't have a body to put in court or to sign an affidavit to show to a, to a federal judge to get a Title III uh, wiretap or, or to get some other kind of process that can, that can help us in a grand jury investigation. But through FISA, we don't have to show that probable cause. We can, we can just show that uh, uh, these are agents of a foreign power and that they are involved in some type of intelligence or, or terrorism-related activity. Now, it's important, but it's not used very often. I mean, the, the number of FISAs we actually get, I think, is published by the department, uh, and, and it is relatively small given the, the large number of requests for it. And yet, we know it's there, and it, 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 can, and it can be and is used in appropriate situations. Um, and uh, what, but what it gets down to, the bottom line is, the best cases you can make are, you can build your way up with, uh, with currency transactions, with uh, arrests for non-terrorism crimes, um, with uh, wiretapping and other means of surveillance. But at the end of the day, the best evidence comes from somebody who is a confidential informant who can tell you, I had this conversation, or can even record the conversation for you. In addition, and to buttress that, we work closely with the Treasury Department and with other organizations that help us collect financial information to see the flow of money and see who is making what, uh, what transactions. The uh, Treasury Department actually collects information called uh, suspicious activity reports, and that often is the source of a lead for a terrorism financing investigation. See, something is not quite right. It gets reported to them. The Joint Terrorism Task Force reviews it, and suddenly we, we have an investigation. It's hard to say that there's any one particular pattern for the way these investigations start. They seem to come from all over. It might come from that, the lead I just mentioned from, a, from an SAR. It might come from confidential informant. It might come from somebody flipping in, or uh, deciding to cooperate in another type of case. And that can come from any unit that we have. It can come from our securities fraud unit. It can come from our narcotics unit. It can come from our uh, organized crime unit. You just never know where the next lead is going to come from. And we work very closely with the Joint Terrorism Task Force and also with the Criminal Division in Washington to make sure that we have the department as a whole has a global picture of what's going on in the counterterrorism area in order to try to get resources to the place where it matters most at, at that moment. Um, I think we're going to continue to see material support cases. At first, that surprised me. but. When you think about it, it actually makes sense. The United States is a huge center for finance and wealth. And it, it, it's ironic, but where better to come to get money, even if it's money to harm American interests and to damage American national security, than from within the United States itself? And so the terrorists will keep coming here. They will keep trying to raise money. And even if it's, I mean, even if it's only part of the solution, as it inevitably will be, it's still important to block every dollar that we can from getting into terrorist hands because terrorists are, are, are fairly lean and efficient organizationally. 
even a dollar they can put to bad use. They can buy a, a bullet or an explosive for that. So if we can stop them from getting a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million dollars, that may be one more terrorist act that we prevent here or somewhere else in the world, or two or twenty or a hundred. We just we never know what the ultimate impact is, and the struggle is to to keep going, to keep. Uh, grasping at every avenue that we can in order to try to disrupt and prevent terrorism, even, even in those cases where it doesn't blossom into a full-blown uh, counterterrorism uh, counter trial like the one we have going on in Brooklyn right now. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, but that's my, and I'm, it's my global view of where we are and where we're going on counterterrorism investigations in the EDNY. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, during my uh, period for making comments, um, I'd like to make two observations and in the course of those observations also raise uh, two questions. Um, before doing that, I think it's probably helpful to clarify my personal perspective. Uh, I've been out of the Justice Department since 1998, um, and as a prosecutor, I did not have much practical experience in foreign uh, terrorism. Uh, my principal experience in that respect in terrorism cases was in domestic terrorism. Uh, as Professor Schroeder said, I was one of the trial attorneys in the Oklahoma City bombing cases. Uh, I also was uh, involved in uh, more limited respect in terms of uh, coordinating and supervising some of the investigations of the Montana Freeman. Um, also, uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s, which seems a little bit like ancient history, but not that far long ago, the issue of domestic terrorism that was facing the United States was a substantial threat. Um, in addition to the Oklahoma City bombing and the Montana Freeman, we had the Unabomber and the incident at Waco and a number of other uh, incidents and crimes that were uh, committed by domestic terrorists. And uh, maybe this is my personal perspective, but I think sometimes in the now in the wake of September 11th, um, we have a tendency to forget or at least minimize the threat that we faced back in the 1980s and 1990s, the threat that was promote that was posed by domestic terrorism. Um, there was a, stati a statistic back then that that I was aware of that was very frightening. There was a sense that these that Timothy McVeigh and and Terry Nichols and the Unabomber were um, were kind of unusual cases. In fact, they were really kind of the tip of the iceberg that existed and that law enforcement was aware of at that time. Um, I think there were armed militias that were actively organizing and plotting acts of domestic terrorism in 49 of the 50 states in the United States back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And I think that uh, we have a tendency to forget or, or maybe minimize that through the use of very traditional law enforcement techniques and through the application of due process procedures in traditional uh, criminal justice prosecutions, uh, we did, law enforcement, um, did successfully neutralize the threat that was posed by domestic terrorism at that time. And so I recognize, my first point is I recognize that foreign terrorism, international terrorism, is a different threat. Um, and I'm not suggesting that they are the same. Uh, but I think we should reflect on, as we go forward in the war on terrorism in the 21st century, I think we should reflect on why the tactics or techniques that were successful in the war on domestic terrorism, why those techniques uh, were successful. And I think as we reflect on that uh, issue, and try to learn the lessons from history, we should be focusing on a number of questions, but I think one principal question is, that whether by abandoning or compromising our commitment to certain due process principles, uh, are we really uh, neutralizing the threat that's posed by international terrorism, or are we perhaps fueling that threat? I don't uh, purport to know the answer to that question, but I think it's one that's important that we should be reflecting on. Uh, the second point that, that I would make is I think we should be doing more to focus on the qualitative aspects of intelligence gathering as opposed to the quantitative volume of information we're gathering. And let me just use two uh, specific examples. You've heard a lot about electronic FISA uh, surveillance. Um, 
in and Andrew had uh, said a moment ago that you know that some of these numbers about FISA intercepts and FISA surveillance are publicly reported. Uh, then the statistics I think are important. In 2000, in, in calendar year 2000, there were just over a thousand uh, applications that were submitted for uh, electronic surveillance to the FISA court. All of them were approved. In 2003, that is the second year after September 11th, that number jumped to over 1,700. So it nearly doubled in only about a two or two and a half year uh, period. But if you look back at the report and the study that was uh, issued by the 9-11 Commission, one of the principal problems that they identified was not the lack of a volume of the quantity of information that was available to law enforcement. It was rather the quality of the information that law enforcement had and their ability, that is the number of people that were able to analyze the available da data. We've all heard about, you know, the, the phrase that was bandied about was the ability to connect the dots. So the issue was not, was not uh, quantity. The issue was, uh, was quality. Well, my concern is that, uh, that notwithstanding our commitment to the war on, on terrorism, we've not really focused on the qualitative aspect. There was an article uh, just a few months ago in the New York Times in September of 2004 that as of that point, there were 120,000 hours of electronic surveillance, tape-recorded conversations of suspected Al-Qaeda members. I'm not just talking about all of the interceptions, but 120,000 hours of Al-Qaeda-related uh, recordings that had not yet even been translated, much less reviewed. So we have been expanding the weapons uh, available to law enforcement and giving them the ability to gather more information. But I guess my question is whether we have made available sufficient resources and sufficient expertise to be able to analyze and review that information because that's going to be uh, critical to the success of the war on terrorism. And so when I look back at, you know, the, all the civil liberties debates, I mean, the debate is not simply whether we should give it up, give up certain civil liberties or privacy interests um, in order to advance national security. I think most rational, reasonable people would say, yeah, I'll make some sacrifices in that regard in order to protect myself, protect my family, to protect the nation. The question, though, it's not that simple. The question is, are we giving up those, uh, those important rights and yet advancing, truly advancing, our national security? The second example that I would give in addition to Pfizer surveillance is uh, coercive interrogations. We've seen a lot of publicity about the interrogation techniques that have been used in some of the counterterrorism uh, investigation. Well, we're in a law school setting. Everyone's familiar, and many people here are familiar with the criminal justice process. One of the reasons that the Fifth Amendment says that coerced confessions are inadmissible is not simply because it offends our notion of what is uh, justice and fair play, but because the statements that are produced in response to a coercive invest interrogation are unreliable. Somebody will say anything to get out of a coercive interrogation uh, situation. So the the public debate seems to have been focused principally on the propriety of the techniques that uh, have been used. And that's important. But I think it's also as important, or in my view, maybe more important to be focusing on whether we're using techniques that are, in fact, gathering reliable information, information that will truly help us uh, in the war on, on terrorism, or are we just gathering more information that really won't advance uh, those interests? Uh, I, I make these observations and I pose these questions uh, conceitedly as an outsider. As I said, I've been out of the Justice Department since 1998. Uh, I haven't been participating in the investigations. I, don't, I haven't had a seat at the table in terms of internally uh, discussing these issues uh, for nearly seven years. Based on my experience, I have great confidence in the integrity uh, and the competence of the law enforcement officers who are, who are actually at the table, who are uh, having these conversations internally. But the question that I have, having been kind of on the front line, is your day-to-day -day responsibilities and the pressure of protecting people sometimes prevent you as a law enforcement officer from actually asking these kinds of questions. You're doing your job. You're doing your job as best you can. Uh, 
Um, and I would simply ask, and I think it's part of the public debate as well as part of the internal debate that the Justice Department uh, is engaged in and the, and the administration is engaged in, they should be reflecting on these questions because I think they're important uh, in order to, to safeguard the country. Thank you. Let me introduce our last speaker, uh, whose introduction I saved until uh, he could arrive. <laughs> Judge Gerald Rosen has just spent one of those annoying travel days that uh, you can run into in Had the winter. a wonderful tour of the skies of Philadelphia and the airport. <laughs> Philadelphia. I felt like that Tom Hanks character. <laughs> Terminal. Well, we, we're glad you got out faster than he did and were able to make it uh, Didn't to feel us like this it. afternoon. Uh, judge Rosen has been um, a district court judge on the Eastern District of Michigan since 1990 when he was appointed by uh, President Bush. He is uh, a much sought after uh, speaker and author on a uh, number of topics um, related to um, federal trial practice, uh, civil procedure, uh, evidence. He co-authors two books on, on those subjects. Um, and um, criminal law, labor law, legal, legal advertising. And, and since 9-11, he's written and spoken a, a number of occasions on uh, the court's role in handling terrorism cases. He um, apparently doesn't do enough writing in his opinions because uh, he, he is very uh, very active uh, scholarly agenda outside of uh, off the bench. Uh, he, uh, the event in his courtroom that brought him a lot of press that he probably w would rather not have had was uh, his presiding over a trial of uh, several members of a sleeper cell in Detroit uh, and after their convictions finding that the uh, prosecution had withheld uh, exculpatory evidence. Uh, there ensued an investigation. Um, in which Attorney General Ashcroft turned over the investigation to an independent counsel who discovered that there, in fact, had been numerous uh, documents and uh, evidence withheld, uh, which uh, eventually led Judge Rosen to have to overturn some of those uh, convictions. Uh, so we're delighted you could make it here today, and we're looking forward to your remarks very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm probably more delighted to be here than <laughs> than you are to have me. In fact, uh, an hour and ten minutes ago when we were bumping around the skies over Raleigh, uh, I would have been happy to just be anywhere. <laughs> but uh, I am I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm glad I didn't delay you. Um, as I walked in uh, and sat down, Chris slipped me a note and he said, since we haven't, I haven't met any of these gentlemen, or we haven't talked, uh, I was a little bit uh, Curious as to what we were going <laughs> to what we were going to do here, uh, but he, Chris, was kind enough to slip me a note and say that we're going to talk about quote how terrorist cases work unquote. Um, as Chris alluded uh, in his introduction, I thought maybe I could talk about how ter terrorist cases don't work or shouldn't work anyway, uh, and I may have something to say about that. Um, I do have a few thoughts on the war on terrorism, and particularly the war on terrorism in the courts and how it plays out. The other, my co-panelists have uh, talked about how terrorism cases get put together, uh, and that's appropriate for them to talk about since they're in the trenches, putting them together and trying them. But I thought I would talk about sort of the view from the bench and uh, the role of the courts, the ju judiciary, in the war on terrorism. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but I thought, as some of my co-panelists have done, uh, given a little overview of the geography of where they practice, I thought I'd talk about Detroit a little bit because, uh, well, the Super Bowl is going to be there next year. And of course, we just uh, got some unwanted publicity uh, arising from our basketball team and uh, <laughs> the behavior of some of our fans and players. Um, but we are actually a very interesting area, and some of the things that make us interesting uh, are things that also uh, provide fertile ground uh, for cause for concern for uh, terrorism and potential sleeper cells. Uh, Detroit is, uh, has the largest Middle Eastern population outside of the Middle East. And we it is not simply a Middle Eastern population, 
it is a very diverse Middle Eastern population and culture. I think we have virtually every segment of Middle East culture represented in our greater Detroit metropolitan area. And I must say, I have many friends in the Middle East community and it adds a great deal of richness to our community. But it also provides an opportunity for folks who uh, have not so friendly thoughts about our country to come and easily blend into our population. In fact, uh, Steve Emerson, who some of you may have seen, he's one of the talking heads on NBC and terrorism experts, he's written a book called American Jihad, uh, which I would recommend to many of you, uh, which identifies Detroit as one of the top three places where uh, terrorist cells may well thrive and survive. Um, in addition, another reason why we are uh, an opportune target uh, is that we are an international border city. Little known fact is that Detroit is the only major city in the United States that is actually north of Canada. Now that doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that it's a, <laughs> that it's a potential terrorism site, but uh, it is a border city and it, the border is the Detroit River and Lake Sinclair and Lake Huron which of course provide a lot of opportunities and we have a very very porous border both in the lakes and uh, on the Detroit River we have a lot of islands and in fact there are parts uh, of the De greater Detroit area where you can literally take a rowboat from Canada and row over to one of these islands and you're in the uh, you're in the United States I was driving into work with one of my colleagues yesterday morning and he was telling me about an alien smuggling case on Harsons Island, which is about a third of a mile from the Canadian border. And they simply took a rowboat, <laughs> came over, they were on Harsons Island, and the only reason they got caught was because the guy who picked them up had an expired tag <laughs> on, his, on, his, on his place, otherwise they were in. Now these folks, I don't, I quickly add, were not involved in terrorism, but I think you can see the problems that a porous border can cause. And our border authorities try to do the very best job they can, but uh, you know, obviously they're not perfect. And borders like the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair uh, make life very difficult for them. So that's just sort of the background. Um, Jeff sort of teed up for me in talking about some of the uh, constitutional rights issues inherent in terrorist cases, what I wanted to talk about uh, briefly. Um, and that is this. We, as a society, must rely upon the executive branches, the executive branch and the legislative branch of government in the first instance to uh, enact policies and take uh, enforcement action to protect us. And that is as it should be. But ultimately, we are a nation that defines itself by law. And it is ultimately in the courts that uh, the limits upon and the proper deference to be given to the executive branch and, le and legislative branch, where that will be defined. These are very difficult issues for all of us in government, uh, but most especially for those of us in the courts. Perhaps I think our greatest challenge in the coming years on, as the war on terrorism sort of plays out will be to confront this new threat in such a way as to preserve our most uh, fundamental and cherished civil liberties while at the same time permitting those responsible for protecting us in the executive and legislative branches to effectively safeguard our lives. And this is not uh, an easy balance to strike. Um, so for those of us in the courts, I think that the question is not so much uh, how will the war on terrorism uh, change how we protect ourselves from outside threats as it is in the legislative branch and to a great extent in the executive branch, but rather Will the war on terrorism change the nature of the constitutional protections that we depend upon in the courts to safeguard our civil liberties? And there's another question inherent in that, 
and that is, will it change uh, or ultimately impinge upon judicial independence? Because inherent in this question of the role that judges play in the war on terrorism as it comes out in the courts uh, is whether or not judges will uh, view themselves as part of the war on terrorism uh, and essentially uh, be, have the same concerns that uh, play out the same concerns that the executive and legislative branches play out, or will we continue to exercise our institutional independence and not simply be a rubber stamp for the executive and legislative branches? Um, we're seeing this played out now in the courts. And this may seem to some to be a question that is perhaps overdrawn, but just think about how these, issue, how these issues are right now percolating up through the courts. Because there, some of these issues that we've just taken for granted through the years are being seriously debated. And there are very difficult questions, as Jeff's presentation alluded to, on, on both sides. And think about some of the rights that uh, are being considered by judges all over the country now, such as the right of access to the courts, the right to counsel of people who are detained, whether detained in federal prisons or in Guantanamo or in military, uh, institu uh, military installations, uh, and the right of confrontation and the extent of the right of confrontation in the courts and the right of folks who are suspected of terrorist activities a right of them to have access to potentially exculpatory information. These are all very serious questions that are being played out in the courts. Uh, the Supreme Court has had an opportunity to consider uh, three cases. They only spoke substantively on two cases, and I'm not going to go through those, but uh, one of those cases was the case of Hamdi versus Rumsfeld. And uh, as I said, I'm not going to go through it, but I do think that the language that the justices used in the Hamdi case, in the majority opinion, was very interesting because it sort of framed the debate. And in that, the court began, the majority began, by talking about the need for courts to defer, in some cases, to, quote, the exigencies of the circumstances that, that demand I'm sorry, the extingencies of circumstances may demand that enemy combatant proceedings be tailored to alleviate their uncommon potential to burden the executive at a time of ongoing military conflict. So at the beginning of the opinion, the court indicated that there may be circumstances in which courts will have to defer to the executive uh, in these very difficult cases in terms of actions to prosecute or to, uh, or to investigate terrorist suspects. But the one thing that the court made clear in the Hamdi case was that courts are not going to be relegated to the sidelines and just act as a rubber stamp for actions of the executive or legislative branch. Justice Stevens particularly said this, striking the proper constitutional balance here is of great importance to the nation during this period of ongoing combat. But it is equally vital that our calculus not give short shrift to the values that this country holds dear or to the privilege that is American citizenship. It is during our most challenging and uncertain moments that our nation's commitment to due process is most severely tested. And it is in those times that we must preserve our commitment at home to the principles for which we fight abroad. I think that's a clear signal that the courts are not going to uh, simply sit back and rubber stamp actions of the executive and the uh, legislative branches. You're seeing that in a number of other areas. Uh, the D two decisions very recently out of the D.C. Circuit, uh, both from the district court, from two different judges on the district court, have struck a very different balance as to the rights of those detainees down in Guantanamo to have access to the courts. And obviously this is a case that's going to have to percolate up through the uh, District of Columbia Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is going to have to speak specifically on that. Um, 
Another very difficult issue for courts, a very difficult issue which I had to deal with in my case directly, and which I've had to think about very deeply, is the extent, the right of terrorist suspects and the extent of the access that they should be given to classified information. As everybody has alluded to here, uh, many of these terrorism cases, mine included, uh, include either FISA information or SEPA information. I don't know if anybody's talked about SEPA. No. Classified Information Procedures Act. Classified Information Procedures Act is actually an act which governs far, to a far greater degree, the handling of uh, classified intelligence in these kinds of cases. And uh, I don't want to take too long to talk about it. If anybody wants to ask about it during the question session, I will. But it's basically the SEPA Act uh, provides a protocol for courts to handle classified information. I'll tell one story, I suppose. Uh, where classified information is involved, and I'm sure that some of my co-panelists know this, uh, in order to handle it, you must have what is called a secure compartmented intelligence facility, otherwise known as a SCIF. Now, a SCIF is a fully alarmed, separate, segmented off office uh, that can be accessed only through uh, a very highly technological alarm uh, combination system. And you must have that. And that is where you, uh, the court and uh, your law clerks go whenever you have to handle intelligence information. And indeed, that's where prosecutors go and defense lawyers who have been given security clearance. So the SEPA Act really governs a lot of what we do. and. Uh, it is the job of the courts to determine uh, when you have classified information. It's the job of the courts to determine and balance the very important interests that the defendant has to access to potentially exculpatory information, which is also classified. And the balancing of these rights is very, very difficult. Uh, I don't want to talk specifically about my case, but just in general, if you have classified, highly sensitive intelligence, which at the same time is either exculpatory, what we call Brady material, or would provide an opportunity for the defense to effectively impeach government witnesses, what we call Giglio material, or Giglio material, depending on which part of the country you come from. Um, defendants have an absolute right to this information as part of their confrontation rights. And it is a very difficult process for courts to balance the rights of these defendants of access to this information with the very real uh, and very proper national security interests of the government. Uh, I had to face that um, on many levels in my case, both prior to the trial and in the post-trial period that Chris alluded to. And I think there is a case, of course, that has gotten uh, perhaps even more notoriety than my case, which is United States versus Massawi, uh, pending in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, Mr. Massawi has been referred to as the 20th hijacker, and he is accused, accused of being an Al-Qaeda member who participated in planning and was supposed to be part of the events of September 11th, and his case really presents probably the starkest, most direct conflict between these interests that I'm talking about because he alleges and apparently has some support for the fact that detainees in Guantanamo have uh, substantive information, direct evidence, that is exculpatory to him on the question of whether he was intended to be a participant in the events of September 11th. And Judge Brinkema, who, my goodness, I, <laughs> I can only imagine what she's going through. Uh, and Judge Brinkema is trying to sort out these interests and not getting a lot of help, frankly, from her colleagues on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals <laughs> as this case has bounced up and back. Uh, the government has consistently argued that Massawi is entitled to no access to these detainees, uh, 
whatsoever for any purpose and that Mr. Massawi should have to be satisfied with written summaries prepared by government uh, investigators of statements made by the detainees without an opportunity to question them uh, in, in any way. So I think, you can, I think you can see that there is this very, very direct conflict between the interest that Mr. Massawi has, the right to exculpatory information, uh, and the interest, the very real interest that the government has. The government says these folks down in Guantanamo are not simply uh, enemy combatants and military detainees, they are national security intelligence assets. And as such, criminal defendants in American courts should not be given access to them. Judge Brinkema has done her best to uh, strike a balance between these interests. Uh, and of course, the government has not been satisfied and has appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I found it very interesting uh, when I read the Fourth Circuit's last opinion on this issue because Judge, Chief Judge Wilkins started his opinion with the following quote. He said, we are presented with questions of grave significance, questions that test the commitment of this nation to an independent judiciary, to constitutional guarantees of a fair trial, even to one accused of the most heinous crimes, and to the protection of our citizens against additional terrorist attacks. These questions do not admit of easy answers. Now, I'm not here today to tell you that the judiciary has all of the answers, and I can tell you that I've struggled and continue to struggle in my case uh, with some of these questions of how to give access to defendants and to uh, see that their, these core constitutional rights are preserved, uh, while at the same time allowing the executive branch to do what it has to do to protect us against a very, very real threat. Um, and uh, there's a lot more I can talk about. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the specifics of my case now that I've dismissed the terrorism charges. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't talk too much about that, but uh, I'd also say that I have another terrorism case, uh, the other one, the other terrorism case in the Eastern District of Michigan. My wife wonders if the random draw is really working. <laughs> but that case involves FISA information, and the defendant in that case is accused of providing material support in the form of uh, military equipment to Hamas. So there are a lot of, I'm, I'm going to have to face these issues again in, in that case. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Sarah? the panelists would talk a little bit about the use of the material witness material witness provisions and um, how you see them fitting in both in terms of their effectiveness and the sort of right hand side of the panelists talk a little bit about the civil liberties perspective so I'm not sure if I'm the right hand side or the left hand side <laughs> <laughs> um. The uh, use of material witnesses, material, I assume you're talking about detention of material witnesses pursuant to material witness warrants, is a long-standing practice uh, in American criminal law enforcement. Um, it was used very aggressively, uh, especially by some of my colleagues across the river uh, immediately after the September 11 attacks, but it's, it's by no means a novelty to do that. And, you have to you have to um, you have to go in front of a judge. You have to present the information to the judge to demonstrate that this person has information about a, a specific criminal act, uh, and you have to convince the judge that, but for that warrant, um, which would allow for his detention, uh, that he is likely to, to, to flee. That you're not going to be able to have him. Uh, available to present evidence at a specific criminal proceeding. And the, the statute, I think it's uh, 18 U.S.C. 3144, actually defines, um, <coughs> defines it in that way, proceeding. And there was some uh, litigation about whether that could include a grand jury proceeding, since, of course, grand juries overlay that process with the secrecy inherent in the grand jury. And, and the Second Circuit in uh, Ottawa said that that, that, was, that was appropriate. Um, despite a lower court opinion to the contrary. Uh, 
Uh, like I said when I was when I gave my initial presentation, we in the department are going to use every legal means at our disposal. I, the emphasis being on legal and constitutional, but we will use every means and where it's appropriate to secure detention through a, uh, a material witness order, we'll, we'll do that without hesitation. Now, that's not usually the most efficient way of going about things. It's only in, in, in true uh, exigency when, when you do that. And it, it often turns out that the people you want to detain um, are, in fact, themselves ultimately criminal defendants. But they can't be the reason you get the warrant in the first place. You can't get a material witness warrant on, on a, for, for a sham reason just to hold somebody until you can collect evidence to prosecute them. That, that's, not, that's clearly not permitted. But if that person does have information, as you know, I don't like co uh, commenting on other people's cases, but I think this one is mainly wrapped up, as was clearly the case in Ottawa, um, it, 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 it's appropriate. It's not, it's not particularly novel. It, it may be that people in that situation are detained for a long period of time, and a court has the authority to regulate that detention and decide what, is how, how long is too long. Uh, or is the, uh, does, is the department actually holding this per person for a proper purpose or not? But it's all under court supervision and done in, uh, in the... In the if not the, the, light of, the light of day, because it still may be pursuant to uh, secret grand jury proceedings, at least it's under the supervision of Article Three judges. Well, if I can make, and then I'll give you a chance, and if I can make two observations. One is I have to respectfully disagree. The use of material witness warrants has been a longstanding practice of the Justice Department. But up until 9-11, uh, it had rarely, if ever, been used to detain an individual who was a material witness in a grand jury proceeding. It had been used to arrest and detain somebody Those who was a material witness in a criminal trial, in a criminal case that was already pending. And the departure post 9-11 was the use of that technique to detain witnesses in a grand jury proceeding. Um, the courts of the Second Circuit has ultimately held that it is permissible and that the word proceeding in the statute did, in, did contemplate grand jury proceedings. Um, so the statute permits it, but the tactic had been rarely, if ever, used by the Justice Department prior to 9-11. The second point is, because that tactic, in a criminal case, if a case is pending, there's a, def there's a defined period of time in which the trial will go. It's generally much shorter than the length of a grand jury proceeding. Um, and the cases, if you read the cases, the two district court cases and the court of appeals cases, there's a lot of, of evidence in those opinions or a lot of discussions in those opinions that the courts were concerned that the Justice Department was in fact using the material witness as a kind of a preventative detention mechanism for somebody that they in fact suspected was culpable in the criminal conduct as opposed to merely a witness. Again, I don't, I, I don't suggest that the Justice Department shouldn't be using it in those contexts, but the problem is when it's used in that context, it gives rise to the risk or concern that it's being used as a preventative detention mechanism. Although there's nothing in the statute that says you can't have suspicions that that person may ultimately become a criminal defendant, as long as that's, as long as he has material information. And it's also, it's not just the Justice Department, it's also been used in, in state court proceedings in grand jury situations as well. Yeah, but that's a different, that's a different I'm just, statute. I'm just, We're talking I, about the federal I, statute. I'm just, I just mentioned it to, to suggest that yeah. it's not quite as novel as some have suggested. Go ahead, Judge. Post 9-11, the issues surrounding material witness statute and material witness warrants always seem to revolve around the real purpose for which the person is being held, the length or duration of detention, and the nature of access that the suspect or material witness has to the courts. These are very difficult questions for prosecutors and for courts. Uh, on the one hand, I think we all, both in the courts uh, and particularly in academia, have to step back and ask ourselves, what is the public expectation? What does the public expect of us? You know, I teach in academia, so I'm well aware of the views of some of my colleagues in academia. And they all make sense if you're just looking at the four corners of some law review article in front of you. 
But remember, we live in the real world, and I can tell you from my experience with the terrorism case that I had, which was the first post-9-11 terrorism case to actually go to trial, that there are all sorts of people out there, educated, smart, intelligent people, who have different expectations of the justice system. And their expectation is that these people should be held because if they're suspected of being involved in terrorist activities, they constitute an imminent danger to the community and perhaps to the country. So none of us should ever divorce ourselves from that notion that there are real-world expectations out there that all of us have to be aware of. And if judges go too far in intruding upon the enforcement activities of the executive branches, I think we will greatly threaten and undermine the independence that I talked about earlier. Having said that, because the expectation of people is that law enforcement, whether state, local, or federal, has to protect us from the cataclysmic types of events of 9-11. That's the first thing. The second thing is on the, uh, on the issue of abuse and the potential for abuse of the material witness warrant. I think there is a very important abject lesson for us in the case of Brandon Mayfield out in Oregon. A very close friend of mine, a colleague out there, co-author of mine, had that case, Judge Robert Jones. For those of you who don't know, Brandon Mayfield was a young Muslim Islamic lawyer who, as it turned out, just coincidentally happened to represent some folks who had been involved in supporting the Taliban. And uh, the FBI came into possession of some fingerprints from authorities in Spain that looked like, when they were transmitted over, Mr. Mayfield's fingerprints. And Mr. Mayfield seemed to have been connected with the train bombings in Spain. And fortunately, Mr. Mayfield had access to a lawyer who was able to get access to, through Judge Jones's intervention, was able to get access to the actual transmission of fingerprints from Spain and was able to show the FBI in the first instance, first the prosecutor and then, then to the FBI, that the transmission that was relied upon was of sub such substandard quality that you needed to look at the original fingerprints. Those were brought over and it clearly showed that those were not Mr. Mayfield's fingerprints and fortunately he was released. So that's the other end of the spectrum. There is a great deal of possibility uh, for abuse uh, in the material witness warrant. I mean, I think in a worst case scenario, what could have happened is that Mr. Mayfield could have been expeditiously extradited to Spain without ever having had the opportunity to fully contest the issues uh, raised against him which would have been a terrible travesty. So we have to be aware of these two sort of bookends of the spectrum. And as I said, those of us in the justice system and those of us in academia, I think, tend to sometimes too narrowly focus on, on some of the fine points and academic debating points and forget about the expectations that people have of all of us. I had an early hand in the back, yeah. Discuss the two different paradigms, the war paradigm and criminal paradigm, and how in terrorism this is really a new third paradigm. Um, as far as creating a new court as an idea that was brought up in that last um, session, what would your perspective from the judiciary be of that? And if we should have it, what should that look like as far as due process, how open it should be? Is that a question for me? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> I'm probably the wrong one to ask that question. I'm, I'm not a great fan of special courts. Uh, special courts have been uh, special courts have been uh, proposed in a lot of different areas: patent law, intellectual property. Uh, of course, we have special courts in bankruptcy and tax law. Terrorism is perhaps different, but uh, I'm not I'm not a big fan. I, I think the criminal justice system that we have is equipped to handle terrorism cases. Uh, the harder question is. Uh, and the question that the Supreme Court sort of alluded to in the Hamdi case is at what level 
at what point in, this, in, in the process do folks have access to a neutral quasi judicial or quasi-judicial forum that is maybe not the civilian justice system? And the court raised that and certainly didn't, uh, certainly didn't uh, decide it in the Hamdi case. But I think that's a very, very difficult question. For example, these folks down in Guantanamo, this is obviously the issue that's going to play out. The folks down in Guantanamo, uh, is the military justice system sufficient to provide at least minimal guarantees of due process? Um, because I, I don't think you can have sort of a one-size-fits-all system. It depends upon the nature of the detainee. It depends upon whether the detainee is an American citizen. It depends upon whether he's being held uh, on American soil or an American military ins installation. Uh, and it depends upon the natures of rights that he's trying to assert. Is he simply trying to gain access to the courts through the habeas process? Or is he trying to assert substantive rights? All of these issues are very difficult, but it, I don't think that it requires a special judicial system, a special sort of a terrorism crimes court system. Uh, the professionals in the uh, Justice Department are perfectly capable of handling these cases investigatively, and uh, I think my colleagues and I are capable of handling them in the courts once they get to the courts. The threshold question of, you know, where do you where do you start is a different question. And that, I think, is going to be, over the next few years, is going to be defined by the appellate and then probably ultimately by the Supreme Court. Do you guys who are prosecuting these cases have a well, I, I can on offer you'd like a different system? To uh, well, I would offer that I would not like a different system. I'm uh, comfortable with our current system. I think it's a wonderful system. And um, I, I think that terrorism cases can be brought successfully in court. I, I don't see a uh, an compelling need to create this new animal. <clears throat> I also think that if perhaps some of these connect the dots type issues are resolved. And the Patriot Act did begin to resolve some of them. Because if you recall, one of the things that the Patriot Act created or, or really discreated was this wall that separated the intelligence communities from the law enforcement communities. And the panelists have been discussing this thing called FISA. You should know that it's a source of information that before 9-11, as a prosecutor, I couldn't even look at, regardless of the quality of the information. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, Jeff has a comment that there may be this great content of information that because of resources, because of the languages involved, they may not even be in play right now. So I think if we continue to try to connect the dots under our existing structures and perhaps get more dots through translations and, and perhaps more resources, that the criminal justice program as devised by the founding fathers and the one we've been using should be fine. Um, now, there's obviously other equities involved and certainly other agencies, depending on where events are taking place, that have a very large say in whether a case is even brought to court. And the judge has alluded to that, some of those folks being kept in Guantanamo Bay, for an example. They're there because, if you read the public accounts, they were caught on the battlefield. So uh, perhaps not all, but certainly the majority, according to the public source information. So whether you get into the courts or not, I agree, is a question that uh, has to be resolved but, and probably will continue to be uh, debated. But once in court, I, I am very content with the processes, processes that we have in place right now. Um, I get I have one brief comment on that, which is I, I can't, and I assume Bill can't either, comment uh, on legislation for the department. So this is really my view, uh, not the government's view. Uh, and I can't say very much about that proposal because I'm not sure of all the details, but I will say one short thing about the limitations of our system, which I alluded to in my opening remarks. We're only part of the solution in the legal Title 18 world in prosecuting terrorism. We work closely with the intelligence community, with the military. There are things that we can do 
uh, to help them and the things they do to help us. And certainly getting information through FISAs is helpful. But there are corresponding limitations. We get Sometimes we get excellent information we can't use, even, even with the protections uh, inherent in, uh, in the SEPA statute that Judge Rosen referred to. Uh, even then, there are some pieces of information about particularly long-term threats or, or, or particularly dangerous threats that we don't want to disclose in that form, or the intelligence community doesn't want us to disclose since they're the ones who make that decision. So the, the, our Title 18 uh, criminal justice system is not a uh, panacea for the war on terrorism. It's, it's merely a part of it. The ultimate question is, what do you want to do with that person if you have him detained, wherever it is? What do you want to happen to him? Do you want to go to him to go to a federal prison? Do you want him to be detained under military custody? Do you want him sent to another country? Do you want him ultimately paroled and sent back into the world? Those are the, that's the first question you have to answer when you decide what kind of a system you want. Because if you want him to go to federal prison, obviously he's got to go through, all, he has the full panoply of rights, whether he's a citizen or a non-citizen. If you just want to detain him for the duration of the conflict, however long that may be, then another set of, uh, of protections apply, which are necessarily much more limited than the protections that we under, enjoy in our constitutional system. Yeah. Yes, my question is for uh, the two gentlemen from, from Justice. Um, we're talking about FISA, and my question is regarding what, what, what incentives do you, do you have as prosecutors uh, against utilizing the FISA system to get in intelligence information, given that the court um, does not uh, reject or has not um, rejected um, very many requests at all since it was uh, started in the late 70s? Well, first of all, and I, I agree with what Andy said, that last comment was purely the comments of Bill Hochul and whatever's ultimately decided in the department is fine. Uh, you've got to understand from a uh, <clears throat> purely mechanical point of view, the FISA techniques are really brought by a different branch of the United States government than the Western District of New York, where I work. There's another group within Department of Justice called the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, OIP. And policy Review. Policy Review, something along. And basically, they're the ones who go before the FISA court, which sits in Washington, D.C., and they apply and obtain this FISA warrant. And if, in fact, this agency of the department decides to pursue that technique, then the information flowing from that technique is then what could or couldn't be shared with we prosecutors. As, as far as disincentive or incentive, well, you have all kinds of requirements that you have to show before you can even use this FISA technique. One is you've got to prove to these judges, and by the way, while they're not judges in the sense of Judge Rosen, um, they're called FISA judges, they are judges. They're Article Three judges. Yeah, and, and they are judges. They sit in secrecy and they, they sit they in privacy. They are Article Three. Yeah, judges. they're Article Three yeah. judges. So one, the one from each circuit. You have to satisfy these judges of probable cause that the target is an agent of a foreign power. So if you can't make that showing, that would be one disincentive to even be able to use a technique. So you got to have some evidence even to get in the door to be able to convince an Article III judge who's sitting as a FISA judge that you should use the technique. And then they also have to demonstrate that a significant purpose is intelligence gathering rather than, eh, we know that the U.S. Attorney's Office in Buffalo couldn't get a Title III, so we want to go to you, judge, to try to get this anyway to help their criminal investigation. There's all kinds of thresholds that they have to show. So that's the built-in institutional distance incentive, I suppose. Let me, let me add one practical concern to that, which is FISA applications are extremely rigorously vetted within the department, true. with the emphasis on extremely. It goes through a unit within the FBI. It goes through the Office of Intelligence and Policy Review. It has to be signed by the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General. It is a exacting process. You really have to want it as a, as a, as a unit in the United States Attorney's Office. You really have got to want that FISA, especially when given uh, the number of terrorism crimes and non-terrorism crimes that we have, it is often much more practical to get a Title III if you want to wiretap or to send a, warrant, uh, send a subpoena in, in, uh, for documents. Andy, you're not implying I know that Title III is easy, because I know that the process for getting a Title III authorization within the department, before it even comes to me, 
is rigorous. I've had calls from, I've had calls from assistants uh, at three o'clock saying, "Judge, we hope to be over uh, to your office within the hour with a Title III request." Then an hour later, they say, "Judge, how late are you going to be there?" <laughs> and then another hour later, they sure. call and they say, "Judge, how do we get to your house?" <laughs> and then a couple hours sure. later, they say, uh, "Judge, how late are you going to be up?" <laughs> and so the process, even of getting a Title III authorization, is extremely rigorous and also has to be approved by the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, and it, even that is not simple. So there are institutional safeguards. So we're coming up on the 90-minute mark, so let's take one last question here. Um, you were talking earlier about the connecting the dots process. And I'm interested in how the connecting the dots process overlays with the Brady obligation and the concerns that you might have as a practicing prosecutor or as a member of a JTTF that by participating in it, you're going to open everything, everywhere, all the time to this Brady discovery and the SEPA limitations. And, and so we may be getting better on the investigative side, but at the same time be creating much more um, potential liabilities on the discovery side and just how that uh, dynamic plays. You know, that, that reminds me, there's a great story, uh, Chief Judge Mike McCasey, who's uh, tried the Blind Sheet case in the Southern District of New York and has had a great deal of experience with these cases. Uh, after trying the Blind Sheet case, uh, people were sort of congratulating him and saying, you know, this was a successful case in the sense that, not that the defendant got convicted, but that uh, he had a trial, there was no disturbances, it seemed to go and seemed that the defendant's constitutional rights were assured. But <laughs> as it turned out, uh, Judge McCasey was telling me that a great deal of information in that case that became public ultimately filtered back to Al-Qaeda and was used by Al-Qaeda uh, proactively to shut down, for example, communications facilities and, that they had and shut down cells that had been identified. So as Judge Mukasey says, was that a successful prosecution? Uh, question whether or not the larger interests of the war on terrorism were satisfied. So that's a, that's a very good question. It's hard to answer, and only the folks who are making these decisions can answer that. And I can tell you that there are fights between the Justice Department who want to prosecute cases and CIA uh, who does not want to give up sources and methods of intelligence collection. Uh, and uh, those issues, I was told very, in my case, I was told very directly, uh, those issues would be decided by the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the Attorney General when it comes to the question of whether the prosecution of a case is going to result in the compromise of intelligence sources. This also gets into what Tony Burkow mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, prosecutors lose sleep at night just weighing this Brady type obligation that we have and, and all prosecutors take it so seriously that we tend, as Tony pointed out, to be overly generous in our disclosure. Certainly there's Supreme Court, District Court, Court of Appeals, discussions on what Brady is, but then at the end of the day it's the prosecutor who has to live with this uh, haunting fear that something isn't turned over which is going to end up affecting a prosecution or a conviction because it would come out after conviction as things uh, and truth uh, always does and for us to think that perhaps an innocent man was in jail or heaven forbid we didn't turn over something we had to turn over it's terrible so once the decision is made to prosecute once an indictment's returned you all should know that the decision on Brady really starts coming into uh, into play with our set of glasses on, and, and I'm wearing a set right now, obviously. Uh, so we generally tend to be, I, and I think Tony hit it right on the head, overly generous, and that could uh, influence perhaps what the intelligence communities want to do in future cases. Um, certainly it could affect, as the judge said, perhaps some foreign governments or foreign powers, foreign terrorist organizations getting a hold of some stuff. And it's, uh, it's a very difficult question, a very uh, good one you raised. Well, you've all been overly generous with your time and sharing uh, your expertise with us this afternoon, and I hope everybody will join us in thanking our panelists.